All right, everybody, welcome to SaintCon 2022. We are going to kick it off with our last keynote. This is, his bio is super, super, super long. It is uh, very impressive, probably longer than my arm, maybe both arms combined. The core group, tool, Red Team Alliance, books, runs, has probably run a training on physical security for pretty much every org that exists. <laughs> I was looking at a list. It is massively long. Uh, it's super impressive. If you haven't seen him on YouTube, you're about to. It's my pleasure to introduce Deviant Olaf. How's it going? We could hear me earlier. Can we hear me now? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. All right. There's going to be a lot of show of hands that I'm going to ask you. So we had the lighting doing little things earlier. You can, you can bring these house lights up like another couple clicks, because I would love to see everyone out there. We'll, we'll work on that as we're going. Uh, and as we're also going, I will mention, this is not going to be like most of my usual talks. Uh, very specifically, I'm going to call out things that are outside of the scope of most of our careers. But speaking about risk, and speaking about preparedness for risk, the lighting is perfect, thank you. Um, we are going to talk about some things that are political. We're going to talk a lot about a lot of underrepresented people and a lot of minorities and the threats they face that are very different than the threats people that look like me and a lot of you face. We'll talk about firearms because I do that a lot. I know it's a hot subject. It's not the whole talk. It's just one section. And we are going to talk about the penal system and what happens to people in cages and how to prevent that from happening to you and your loved ones and how to respond and what you will go through if someone you know winds up facing the legal system. Uh, I said my usual abundant swearing. I've been trying to dial it back, especially, I mean, Snow and Jason set really nice examples. And I asked the organizers, I was like, so how, how family friendly is this event? They're like, we try to keep it pretty clean. I was like, well, shit. Um, <laughs> No, we'll see. We'll see. Maybe this will finally be a talk that, um, that my mom would be proud of, although she won't watch this one because of what's in it. No, it's uh, for real. This is I'm not just one of those things where you throw a slide like that up. Like, no offense at all. If it gets too real for you in this room, step outside. I'll just assume that you wanted lunch because we're running a little behind. It's not a problem. We're going we're gonna to talk about some real stuff. Starting off just about risk, though, right? Um, how many people drive a car, right? Life has risks in it. Driving a car it has risks. We try to learn those risks. We try to mitigate for those risks. And when people talk about this, it's usually them saying, well, you got to get somewhere. Everybody drives a car. Uh, because we think about highway accident as risk. But what about other risks when you drive a car? Have you ever had a problem with your car where it wouldn't start or wasn't running reliably, you know, and you couldn't happen to be able to diagnose it or fix it yourself? How prepared you were in that moment and what the severity of that impact was can change how much anxiety it clenched you up, how much you, know, you got impacted. If you're you know, out on the roadside, it's not, it's not working, you're, oh man, what am I gonna do? Maybe you're someone who has a tow service. Like maybe you have a garage in town that you could, maybe it's even not dead yet. Like the car's kind of drivable, it's just making really bad noises. And you're like, I don't know, I checked the parts that are usually noisy and I can't figure it out. So you kind of limp it to the garage. And you know, there's a need to get there, but the urgency isn't extreme. Like, you drove there, you, you, might, you might be able to borrow a car or call somebody, you know, you've got shelter over your head. The worst thing you're really facing is maybe getting ripped off if you don't have a person you like to go to. If you've got a garage you go to all the time, they've been in your family, you're pretty squared away. You can, you can address that. What if you're not in your area? What if you're far from home and you're on a highway and you, now you're like, oh man, this, this car is broken down. I think we're calling a tow truck. Do you know who you would call? Do you know if you have insurance that will cover a tow or not? Do you know if that's the fastest way to get a tow? Or, or do you spend like an hour and a half just on the side of the road waiting in some call center? And it would have been, oh, really? I could have just called the local guy and it would have been 20 minutes and a, you know, $35. Do you know how far a tow truck will take you? They have range. Sometimes they'll say, yeah, well, you might have that garage, but I'm not going to take you all the way across town. I can only take you to these garages. These are things that can jam you up if you didn't plan in advance. Will they drive you in, in their car? Or do you have to get a lift? You have a bunch of stuff in your car. Do you need to get a Lyft XL or something? So like, again, we're talking about a little more urgency here. What if you're in a situation where there is no outside support? What if you do a lot of backcountry, camping, off-roading? What if you live in a place with harsh climate like this? Like At this point, stranded away from services, that's a real urgent matter. That's, we're getting into almost life or death, depends on how far out you're going in the mountains. 
Do you have a kit on you? Do you have first aid supplies, a little fire extinguisher, a jump box, right? How many of you have, this is a curious question. I have a little jump box in my truck, right, if my battery's dead. Who has one? You ever tested it? That's not all those hands. I mean, so maybe, some, maybe you tested it, but you didn't really test it. You tested it by using it the first time you needed it. And you're like, cool, I'm glad it worked. Or maybe it didn't. But you were just, you know, perhaps at some neighbor's, you know, house. You're like, oh, man, I got to get home. Actually, t- we talk about this all the time with security and, and disaster recovery. Test your solutions. If you're not testing them, are you really protected? Being unprepared for bad situations has real consequences. We were just talking about cars, and the consequences were escalating in those examples. But let's talk about worse consequences. So I had a friend. This friend was in custody. They were arrested. And it's not a good place to be, right? The system is cruel. It is uncaring. Their contact with others was very limited. If you don't know how to use prison phones, if you don't know how this works, there's, there's a lot we're going to get into in this talk about being incarcerated. And, you know, they were trying to reach out. Eventually, we got loved ones and people in touch. Like, hey, where, where is that person? They didn't make their flight. And somebody calls somebody, and they get one phone call out. And we finally, oh, crap, so-and-so is incarcerated. We got we to we deal with this. And no one really had a plan. Like, you get enough smart people together, you can figure out, okay, well, I guess need a lawyer, so call a lawyer. But everyone was shooting from the hip. And that lawyer we first got involved, like, they kind of sucked. And it was, they, it was not great. They're, they're trying to do something, and they weren't communicating well. And meanwhile, the rest of us are figuring out how things like bail works while trying to pull out money and fill out paperwork. Eventually got them out on pretrial release. And then you're like, all right, well, what do we freaking do now? And the lawyer's like, well, I don't know what to do. So we got a new lawyer, thank goodness. But they're like, okay, well, the, the venue is many states away. All right, well, okay, what do we do then? Do they take us there? It's like, no, they don't take you. They don't help you at all. The system sucks. You got to get yourself there. We're like, well, how do they have his passport? They have his wallet. Like, how do you figure it out? Learning how travel works. Learning how hotel stays worked. Checking into a hotel when you have no ID and no money. Like, a network of people was there to support this human. But the real crazy thing was the digital side. They were finally breathing free air momentarily, pre-trial, trying to get their life put together and actually get in touch with family, bosses, et cetera, and they couldn't log into anything because they had MFA turned on, right? So where's their MFA token? All right, well, they need their phone. Where's their phone? It's in a drawer somewhere in evidence. And like, what is it actually? So, okay, no, you, you were allowed to get that out of evidence. Well, now he's multiple states away. So they called the old lawyer, who sucks, and that lawyer was able to like get the phone And then what, like FedEx it? No, we needed to get in right away. So the person literally is on an unsecured line talking to this bad lawyer saying, here's how you unlock my phone and I need you to go into my my multi-factor, like rattling off multi-factor codes on a terrible phone line. Like while you're like charged with many bad things, like none of that is ideal. And it's all because things weren't planned in advance the way we're going to talk about here. Now, that eventually was a matter where I think the good side prevailed uh, and everything worked out as best it could, but it was at extreme cost and extreme stress. So the idea of this talk, lawyer, passport, locksmith, gun. I've had this cooking for a while. And the notion is, these are not exotic things, right? These are things that, I mean, they're, they're the yellow pages, right? People talk about and use these all the time. But when you have a need for one, you're like, oh, bro, I need a lawyer. Or like, oh, man, I need a locksmith right now. There's urgency afoot. There's usually like critical thinking skills have kind of gone out the window. So the takeaway is the best time to get a lawyer or a passport or a locksmith or a gun is before you need that lawyer, that passport, that locksmith, or that gun. And we're going to walk through all of these categories and a lot of real world examples and and some facts and some resources to hopefully help you all out. So lawyers, we'll start with lawyers. My wife and I have at least 10 lawyers between us. And that's, you know, because we're of a certain age, we're business owners, this may not all apply to you, but like we have business lawyers for reviewing contracts and NDAs and all that jam. Um, We have a criminal defense lawyer, heaven forbid we're ever jammed up on something. And you will have brushes with the law if you live long enough. Most citizen law interactions tend to be roadside, traffic involved. Uh, maybe you're, you know, not, not quite a Utah thing, but maybe you're coming home from a bar. And like, oh, did you, did you not? Then we walk and turn. Well, we're going to book you when we think it's a suspected DUI. Like, you might be facing it. It might be bogus. Do you have a lawyer to call? We do. 
I had a problem with the TSA. They didn't like how my gun was packed in my luggage one time. And, you know, they kind of, they, they fussed about, and they called the police, and they talked. Okay, and they put me on the plane. But seven months later, I got a letter in the mail. It said, Mr. So-and-so, uh, this was uh, in the incident you had at this airport. You have been found to violate this, some FAA. Uh, please check the box. Do you accept, dispute, pay the fine, and forget about it? And I was like, well, the fine's a few hundred bucks. I could just pay it and forget it. But this is not like a bridge toll. I'm not signing anything involving gun laws until I run it by a lawyer. And I did. And he was like, you should probably run this by a firearms lawyer. So I do that too. I have just specialized firearm lawyers for regular things, for NFA things that I own. Uh, my wife has special practice lawyers for her consulting firm. They, they get really into the CFAA, and they want to make sure that they are not going to find you know, people bashing down the office door. Estate planning. We're going to talk a little bit about this. We're going to talk about things like powers of attorney and wills. This is something that it's, it used to not be fashionable to do. It's like, oh, we don't talk about de death and dying. It became more acceptable to talk about advanced directives and medical planning. You go through a lawyer for that. Let's say you got to go on the offense, right? We've had people in our world, we've had stalkers, we've had unseemly people on occasion, we've had people we've had to collect a debt from or something. We've got lawyers for that. We'll talk about immigration law later in the passport section. It will come up. And there's, again, I have someone on just, I am represented by, and I have brought them in on certain cases you will learn about. Civil rights in particular for underrepresented minorities and vulnerable populations, lawyers who understand what certain people are going through that is different, we will talk about the need for that and if that applies to you, knowing the right person to call. And we also have one more special lawyer. It's a, I'll talk about that towards the very end. But yeah, this, this is lawyers we have actual attorney-client relationships with. We're not paying them all monthly, right? We paid a retainer here or a contract there. This is in addition to all the other lawyers I could make jokes about, like I'm friends with a lockpicking lawyer. I could call James Reeves, the firearms lawyer. He's my buddy. I could, all of my friends at EFF, like half my friends are lawyers. That's why I drink so much. <laughs> but all right, let's, let's get to the worst case scenario for you. As I said, most of, the, most of the time in your life, the worst place you're probably ever thinking about ending up is in handcuffs, right? And not in the fun way. Um, has anyone in this room ever been arrested, willing to admit it? Right. Has anyone ever been detained but not arrested? A little more hands there. I've, I've never been arrested. My wife's been arrested. Tara's been arrested. I've been detained. Uh, I was in San Francisco Airport. I was asking too many questions about the firearm check-in process. So I was officially detained for 15 minutes by SFPD. Uh, so, you know, you get a little paperwork for it. Now, that's, that's a very brief interaction. Um, many of my friends, a, a very non-zero number of my friends, have experienced far, far worse in terms of detention. And the system no matter how brief your interaction with it, is cruel, and it is callous, and it is inhumane. And we will revisit this theme. Many of you, I believe, with those very few hands, have not seen the inside of the coldest, worst places that we create in our society. They are horrible. And minimizing your exposure to that and your loved one's exposure to that is something to talk about. There are great resources out there, right? Flex Your Rights, it's a 501c3. Uh, it, it's all about educating the public about, you know, just regular citizen police interaction. They have terrific videos. One, the old one called Busted is still valid to this day. Uh, their newer ones, their production values have gone up. But check these out, right? Steven Silverman, the whole group are doing a great job. They're easily watchable. They will give you a toolkit of language that you use in terms of, no, thank you, I'm not discussing my day. No, I don't consent to any searches. And learning how to workshop it, watching along with these really cool, like, acted out scenarios, it gives you something to try to invoke and try to remember how to stand up and say, no, excuse me, I don't consent to any searches. If you're just pressed for time, you don't want to watch the long one, who's, who's seen Shut the Fuck Up Friday, right? It's a great clip. Yes, you shut the F up and you ask for an attorney. Now, this is not like you've seen on TV. If you really want to dig into it, like, you can just take a crim pro class. Uh, Professor Joshua Dressler, his criminal procedures class, it's available in audio form. Um, I'm not a law student. I loved it. It's just, it was old cassettes that I ripped. I have the MP3s. And it's all about what the police are and aren't allowed to do and what searches are and aren't permitted in different circumstances. It's fascinating knowledge. So let's say you're actually hip to this. Let's say you watch Law & Order. You know, I, I want my attorney, right? How do you get a lawyer? Movies and TV give you a wildly misleading idea about how this works. You may be in a holding cell for hours and hours. You may have to say, I don't consent to any searches. I'm not answering any questions. I would like my attorney dozens and dozens of times. 
You think it's bad like trying to buy a car and the one car salesman leaves and switches you to someone else? You will get this. You will get different officers and different DAs coming in and out trying to say, so just, I just want to explain what's going on here and say, I'm not making any statements. I'm invoking my right to counsel. If they have a little notepad, they say, well, just tell us what happened. Literally write down and say, what, what time is it? It's 10.45. 10.45. I am not making any statements. I'm invoking my right to counsel. And you hand it to them and it's written down. And you will still just be thrown back in a cell for a while. Let's say they do give you a phone call. Do you even know where you are? Did they tell you what institution you were taken to? Try to get that information before you pick up the phone. They'll be very helpful to let you call somebody, but then they clam up and they're full of no information. They're, they're as unhelpful as a stock boy in a grocery store when you ask, what building am I actually in right now? You may be held for ages. Your phone may be dead. You might have a good number that you want to call and it's in your phone, right? So, let's, let's another good question. How many people even remember phone numbers these days? I get this way too many hands. I, maybe you're awesome. I don't. I remember my wife's phone number, my own phone number, which isn't helpful in this matter, and the phone number of the house where I grew up where no one lives anymore. <laughs> Everything else has gone down the drain with most of my brain cells. If you're in custody, and heaven forbid your, your, your phone is like right there, and they say, oh my God, I need, I'm going to call my lawyer. Their number's in my phone. You know they won't just hand you your phone, right? No, Officer McGillicuddy across the room will say, oh, it's in your phone? Yeah, I'll unlock it for you. What's your passcode? Yeah, he's in your contacts? I'll rattle, go. okay, I can rattle that off for you. And now you're trying to what, talk to your lawyer while your phone is unlocked across the room? So no, if I'm in custody, I will say, I would like my phone call. My lawyer's number is in my phone. And they say, oh, what's the unlock code? I say, no, my lawyer's number's in my phone. Take the phone case off. Doesn't matter if my phone's broken, dead, smashed. My phone number is in the phone. I strongly recommend you make a little card and keep it in your phone case, in your wallet. Again, if, if you are being, at, maybe you're at a public action, at a protest or something, you may be very badly mistreated. You may have your devices taken, smashed, plenty of this. Your devices may be destroyed, but if you have the phone number in hard copy, you can make your phone call. Or if you really expect to be arrested, you, you, know, you put the National Lawyers Guild phone number for your territory on your arm in Sharpie. It's a very common thing to do. Now, what if you're on the other end of that phone call, right? What if a loved one calls you from police custody? What are you, what are you gonna do? Have you ever drilled it? Have you ever actually practiced this call? Because they're not gonna be thinking very clearly. They're going to be very stressed and upset. It is incumbent on you to say, I love you, how are you? Before you even say that, the first thing is, did you shut the F up? Don't tell me why you're there. Don't tell me what's happening. I don't need to know. You are, if you're the loved one getting the phone call, you are the fire department at that point. You only need to know two things. Where's the problem? And I got to get out the door. That's it. Your job is to show support by getting the problem addressed, not by talking. People, you are always being listened to if you're not aware of this. There have been people, and I've known them, who have started to spill the beans. I wasn't even there, and it was, you know, Susan, and then Susan gave the thing to Bob. No, that is not the time for that. Your job, if the loved one is, is calling you, is to say, I got this. People are on the outside working for you. You do not make any statements. Counsel is involved. And then you put the rest of the plan into action that we'll talk about. But that's a little heavy there. We're going to talk about things that, that are different than that. That's, we'll come back to lawyer in a little bit. Lawyer is kind of the the heaviest one, especially because of some things in my life recently. How about section two of this whole talk here? Where's my mouse? There we go. Passport. This is a little more fun. Travel. I like travel. Who here likes to travel? Excellent. Show of hands. Who does not have a valid passport? There's some hands. Who does have a valid passport? All right. I like to see more hands. That's very good. Um, I'm curious. Keep those hands up if you have two passports. There's a few hands. Two valid passports. Does anybody have three? Hands start going down. It's really hard to see it. Does anyone have more than three? Oh, I don't see a single hand. Damn. If you do, come meet me. I want to meet you. You're badass. That's dope. <laughs> they don't have to all be from other countries. You can have multiple U.S. passports. This is my buddy AST. These are three of his passports. Yeah, yeah. Anybody got a black passport? You live in that black passport life, that diplomatic life? You know, get out of trouble in all the foreign countries. It's not true. <laughs> Everyone likes to say that. Oh, I could get in a bar fight in Amsterdam. No, it just means you're not explaining yourself to the local cops. You're explaining yourself to the ambassador. And they don't take bribes nearly as well as local cops. So 
That's a whole thing. Anybody live in the maroon passport deal? That's, I'd be shocked if anyone has a maroon passport. They are super rare. And it means you do spooky stuff with like the DIA and some shit. No, this is AST. Uh, this is his full collection. These are all valid passports at the same time. But that's because he does, you know, spooky things. Um, he has triple citizenship. He does government work. We'll talk about things that are a little bit more achievable in this room. Starting with having a passport. That first question when I said who doesn't have a passport, I, I try not to be super proscriptive. I don't like to say absolutes in this world and a lot of things. This is pretty much an absolute. Everyone should have a passport. Almost no exception to this. And there's, there's, travel is a good thing, right? You could, it's one of the few things you can spend money on and come away wealthier. But there are actual things that will arise in your life. Like, why are passports so critical? They might be for jobs. My wife regularly puts a lot of effort into bringing women and people of color up to stages all around the world at different events where she works with governments, IGOs, NGOs. Who would like a free trip to Paris, right? Do you want to turn that down? Because she's like, hey, that project you were working on, it would be great. We're going to have, bring you to the OECD and talk about that. And you're like, oh, I don't actually have a passport. No, be ready with that, right? What if I hit the lottery and I take everyone to Ireland and Scotland? We go on a whiskey tasting tour, like my 50 best friends or something. I want you to come with me for that. Opportunities come and like, bang, you have to be ready. But there's not a lot of urgency there. Let's get a little more urgent. What if you lose your primary? I hate the stock. Who's a dumb enough person to like leave their whole wallet? I hate stock footage, but... You know, let's say you don't just lose your whole wallet. Let's say you lose your ID, your, your ID card, your license. Uh, it's not uncommon, frankly, in a lot of firearm spaces. If you're renting a gun, you give them your license, okay? And maybe you forgot it there. And you all go home from this trip, and it was real fun. And, oh, it was cool. We shot the machine guns. Oh, shoot, I forgot my license. It's back at the gun range. It's actually really hard to kind of, like, do normal life things if you're missing an ID, and it's your only ID. You can't really drive legally. You can't check into hotels. You can't get on planes that... Having a spare ID in the form of a passport in a drawer somewhere, that's useful even domestically. A little more, and getting your ID back under real ID, they're going to ask for, like, do you have a passport, a birth certificate, et cetera? Getting your, just your driver's license back, it's very helpful if you have maybe a passport with you. It's a good thing to have. But let's get into more, more urgency. Maybe you have a loved one who has a terrible situation overseas. Maybe it's a medical emergency. Maybe it's something, you know, super shady with like, you know, some foreign government is like accusing them of a crime. And you've got to get on the horn with you. And a citizen services unit, by the way, is who you call. Uh, U.S. Citizen Services Unit at the, at the consulate, at the State Department. There's who you, there you want to spin up. But you can, what are you, you're going to get overseas. Maybe there's like a hotel room full of stuff that are they going to throw it in the street? Are they not? Maybe they had a, a young child with them who's in like what? The care of the hotel now, and like you got to get over there. And do, being able to move at the drop of a hat and get somewhere around the world if someone has an emergency of any kind is critical. There are ways you can get an emergency passport from the State Department. They all involve medical urgency. They involve a direct relative, so it has to be blood family or a spouse, which maybe it's not that for you. They also have to be like dead or dying. Someone in hospice, someone who has just expired or is in incredible grave life-threatening situation. If someone's just, you know, locked up on some weird charge and they're not your spouse or your mom, State Department's going to say, yeah, that sure sucks. Here's the phone call for Citizen Services Unit. We'll see what we can do. Having a passport is something that can get you over there to just help manage the situation on the ground. Maybe you're fleeing a threat. I have friends who have had to flee their homes. They've been swatted, they've been targeted, they've been targeted by FASH. Like, they didn't have time to frig around and like deal with paperwork and wait three days for a passport. They had to be gone. Having a passport is really important in a lot of lives. So I've talked about multiple passports at the start, though. How, how is that like possible? What's up with multiple passports? Those of you who have one, maybe you want to start living a bigger, bigger accessibility, different parts of the world. Uh, for a lot of people, 2016 was a catalyst. A lot of people uh, I know personally who have felt really unsafe. Uh, the rise of fascism has been on its way for a while now since then. And we're not out of the woods yet with this last election. It just kind of pumped the brakes slightly on that. There are still real, real risks for a lot of populations who are targeted in this country. And I, I know people who are like, man, I wonder if I could get dual citizenship. You really can. Uh, a lot of us are pursuing it and have been for a while. It's kind of like the old adage, like, like in the movie Casablanca, right? The time to think about how to flee your country is before you have to flee your country. So do the paperwork if you're interested. There are a lot of nations 
that you might not believe have a pathway for you to get citizenship, full passport, and on. There are a lot of nations typically that have had a large diaspora over the years to America. So take Ireland, great example, Ireland. Do you know during the potato famine, Ireland lost most of its population? Not to just death, but like most people just left and they went to the US, Canada, other places, the world. There are tons of people, who has Irish ancestry in this room? There's a lot of us. So if you have Irish lineage, if you have Portuguese lineage, Italian lineage, if you have the right chain of relatives, you can apply for dual citizenship. And it's a good deal for you and for the country because it costs like, it could use paperwork here and a lawyer here and court filing fees. These European nations know the only people who are gonna try to do this are people with professional careers, some discretionary income, and they want to reclaim you as part of their tax revenue, as part of their value to their economy. They want you to come over and they want you to live there a little while. Maybe you'll buy a little property. It makes sense for them to want to reclaim this diaspora of learned you know, minds. They will have a path forward. And some of them really make it open doors in terms of, like, let's say, for, I, I, speak, I can speak to Italy. I know the Italy process very well. You have to have a great grandparent or better who was Italian. But maybe you didn't. Maybe, oh, shoot, it was like great, great, so-and-so, and now they're all dead. You can do the paperwork, pay the money, and have the dead ones posthumously declared Italian citizens, even if they were living in America. And then, hey, guess what? You got a great-grandparent who's Italian. Do the process for you. <laughs> yeah. You just have to do paperwork, right? Even if you don't want to do this right now, these are things that you can start cooking, right? Get with your favorite relatives, your old relatives, and start a family tree. Just literally start cranking it out do the genealogy thing, figure out where your relatives are actually from. Dear God, get the, the spelling of their names right. Because if you ever go on genealogy.com and all your shoestring relatives have like tried to fill in the tree and you get 18 different spellings of one name, try to clean that up, get it, get it the actual details. And then when you get the time, start reaching out to the Department of Vital Statistics or the Departments of Health or old funeral homes. You're going to have to get birth certificates, death certificates, you're gonna get your own paperwork while you're at it. I recommend getting, if you don't have a certified copy of your birth certificate, do it, just get a few. These are just PDFs that you download from this department or that department, and then you gotta fill it out and send in your check or money order for like 17 bucks, and then you wait for it to come back. It takes a lot of time, but it's not a lot of work. The work is done by an attorney. You will get an immigration attorney, Please make sure they speak both your language and the nation's language where you're going fluently. We've had some hiccups with some friends there. But they will just push things through the court. Just let it wind through the court very slowly. And make no mistake, there's a cost involved. You are going to basically buy a decent used car and drive it into a lake. You're just going to say goodbye to like five, $6,000 at the end of this. That's on the low end, depending on country. But to have that, to be able to understand that you can then have the freedom to travel, and all it cost you was learning about notaries and apostilles, apostilles like a notary on steroids. These are, these are terms you're going to learn. It has to do with how documents are accepted in international courts. I've learned all of this in the process, just by doing a little reading, printing a few PDFs, sending some envelopes out. Six, seven months later, the lawyer's like, oh yeah, by the way, we got that thing back from the court. Here's the next step. They tell you what to do. It's not that hard. If you are thinking of any kind of name change or gender marker change, do that now because you want everything to match as the paperwork winds through the system. I'm not really gonna assume that like Italy is gonna understand a gender marker change, not with the fash they just voted in. Speaking of gender markers, if, you, if you're considering an X gender marker, foreign countries may not understand what that is. Talk to your lawyer before you decide to do that here. It could have implications. But the end result is incredible freedom. It is an emergency exit if where you are turns bad and it gives you the freedom to live and work, all the tax problems of like working in other countries and are you allowed to work for six months and not six months, all that goes away with a foreign passport. There's rankings of like what passports are best. Don't put too much into that and don't dwell too much on that. You can see like the American passport gets you to these countries but not those countries and the Singaporean passport has you know more. The, the power rank really, again, like the top one is the UAE. It doesn't mean you can go everywhere. You can't even come to the US without a visa. Power rank just kind of entails what regimes some countries are willing to deal with. 
Uh, because if you trade a lot of guns and oil, like sure, you can go to a lot of authoritarian countries, but honestly, the European, the European passports are the hot ones. And a lot of you, a lot of you might have a pathway forward on that that you never knew. And if this interests you, I encourage you to look into it. It might be something that's really, really achievable. There are crazy loopholes. Like if you're British, if you're from the UK, do you know you can surrender your citizenship to do a, another citizenship and then get it back? But you can only do it once. It's like blowing an e-fuse on a circuit. It's like, here's your one shot. Hope you got that update in. All right, go. Uh, maybe you don't have a past. Maybe you have no family. You don't have even a real name. You just, you, I don't have any citizenship elsewhere. I'm just some guy from America forever. I mean, it is true. You can just kind of buy citizenship, right? Like St. Lucia, $40,000 overseas investment. Now, is it the most powerful passport on that rank? Not the most powerful. But some people, they're like, oh, I don't want to go through all the trouble of this. I'm just going to drop coin on that. Maybe you can just drop half a mil, live in Amsterdam for five years. You can become Dutch. Portugal's the hot one now. For a lot of business owners, a lot of tech company business owners I know, they are doing foreign investment. If you have fluency, you learn the language, you do foreign business investment, you get Portuguese citizenship, get that EU passport. Let's say none of that appeals to you, but you still kind of thought it was cool when you saw someone with multiple passports. You can get a second US passport. Two valid U.S. passports at the same time. Absolutely possible. You can Google this. Google applying for a second passport book. Sometimes this is because you have to travel to multiple places that do not like each other. If you have to fly into Ben-Gurion Airport and land in Tel Aviv, they don't want to see stamps and visa stamps in it from like a bunch of other Arab nations. If you have to go to the UAE or Dubai, like, you know, like I'm going to fly to Dubai, they better not see an Israeli passport stamp. So you can maintain, you can talk to the State Department and say, I've got this travel. If you just do a ton of travel, if you work for a multinational, you show the State Department, like, look at my travel history, look at all these visas. I constantly am sending my passport away to get a visa. They're like, all right, you can just get a second one. That last one, sending your passport away to get a visa, this is the other, even if you don't do a ton of travel, this is something you can do. So if you're traveling on that big map, like some countries need a visa, you don't do that when you land. I mean, some places you do, but most of the time, if you wanna go to China, you have to tell China, hi, I am not Chinese. I would like to come to your country. Here's my travel plans. Here's my business. Here's why I'm there. And they'll say, okay, send us your passport to the consulate. We'll set it all up. We'll put the visa. We'll glue it in there, and we'll get it back to you. This is not fast. It takes a little while. That's why passport expediters exist. A. Briggs is a famous company that does this. Like, we'll do it fast for you. They just pay people under the table. But what you do is if you're going to China or India or someplace that needs a passport with a visa, your visa's in process, immediately book travel to like Canada. Business travel, it has to be business travel. Book the cheapest Canadian you know, business conference in Niagara Falls, who knows. Then you call the State Department and you say, hey, aw shucks, I have business travel overseas and China's got my passport, who could have foreseen? And the State Department will issue you an emergency passport. You can sign up for the, you know, you say, all right, so this many days, come in, emergency appointment. Now it won't always be valid for the full 10 years. Uh, Tara's second passport, is, hers is valid for four years. But having that in a drawer, that is a good thing to have. Again, like you're overseas and disaster, hotel is on fire and you're out on the street and you're like, oh man, I really want to get home and all my, I'm in pajamas. Uh, you could do like the Franca Pontente thing and like born identity and be in that long line of like not having your paperwork and the consulate's trying to help you. Or you call your friend and you're like, hey, go in my safe, get the spare passport and take your passport that I know you have and just come get me the hell home. It's worth thinking about depending on your life circumstances. One more bit on the passport section. When you get your passport, when you submit your DS-11, which if you don't have a passport, fill that form out. Down download the form and make, just tell your friends, I'm finally going to do this thing. Just get the drugstore photographs. Your friends will lean on you to make sure you get it done. You're, are you renewing your passport? That's the DS-82. Get the extra pages. Just get it. It's, it's barely any cost. It takes so much time and pain in the butt. If you run out of pages in your passport, which I have done, and then you have to get the, the blow-in pages, like that stuff you glue in your yearbook and it looks all crappy, just get the extra pages from the, from the get-go. And also, get a passport card. My favorite piece of ID is my passport card. It is not my driver's license. It is not anything else. It's the one that's always on me because it's the best ID to ever have. It's accepted everywhere. It's a federal ID. I can go into courtrooms with it, you name it. I can show it in bars or whatever I want to do. And it doesn't have any information on it. It has no address. It has no personal. It is me and my birth date. 
yes, I am an American. The rest, you do not have to know. I don't, just sell me a whiskey. I don't scan it in. It's not going to scan on that bouncer's device. It's a great thing to have. And it's good for overseas travel uh, via land and water. You can go to Canada and Mexico with just that card. It's a great backup to have. All right. Are we still digging on any of this? Is it being really quiet? Like, are you, are you smoking with it? All right. Now we'll get into the locksmith stuff. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go some. I'm glad you're happy now. We're going to get all happy, then we're going to get real sad. I haven't rehearsed this talk without crying. So we'll get to that part. Locksmith. Most locksmiths do what we'll call daytime work. A lot of locksmiths, they'll cut keys, they'll sell you locks, they'll do installs. There's nothing really urgent there. But a lot of people who need a locksmith, they need them when something's urgent. They're literally locked out. It's nighttime. They can't find someone with a spare key, et cetera, or they're in a parking lot. They've got their car. They've locked their keys in their car. This is when people are vulnerable. People get preyed upon by scammers because if you don't know who to call, you are vulnerable to the person who picks up the phone. You say, yeah, locksmith. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'll be right out there. And they might not be a real locksmith. They might just be someone who put a bunch of Yellow Pages listings, and they cause a bunch of damage and overcharge you and break things and leave. This is a real well-known problem. How do you mitigate for it? By getting a locksmith before you need the locksmith. Go around during daylight hours. Find a brick and mortar locksmith shop. Get to know who they are. Say hello, look for maybe the Aloha logo or go to findalocksmith.com, which is how you can search for an Aloha certified locksmith. Walk into the shop. Say hi, I'm in the air. how long you've been in the area, what do you do here? Do you, uh, do you, have, a, do you have a lockout service, by the way, in after hours? Oh, so this, can I take this card? Cool. Uh, do you do automotive as well? Not everyone, oh, cool, you do automotive. Nice, nice. Well, that's awesome. Well, while, while I'm here, I'll get a copy of my key, but uh, nice to know you're around. And then you save that number. And then you take that spare key, because how many people actually have a spare key to their place? You should consider, and what you're doing with that spare key. Like, holy Christ, please don't use this lockbox. We had lockpicking lawyer here, and you've seen his videos, like the Master 5400 series, all of these style of lockboxes, even the clones, they are terrible. You can watch him rip through all of them and decode them on all of his videos. Uh, do not, do not, do not use that as a lockbox for your spare key. The one I actually like is made by Supra, uh, the Supra C500. Uh, I haven't found a way personally to destroy it. Uh, LPL, if you're watching, uh, do a video about this. Make me cry and look wrong at this, but... Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe that's one way to keep your key outside. Automotive is a fun one, by the way. Here's something for everybody out there who has one or two big vehicle keys, especially if they're chipped keys or transponder keys. Go ahead and if you want, get a spare key, because if you don't have a spare key, you don't go to the dealer, you go to the locksmith. They can do the exact same thing. It's not going to avoid your warranty. It's going to cost you way less. But get one more car key cut on bare metal. No chip, no transponder. That's the key that you go under your vehicle's frame, look for a hole, and zip tie it to the frame of your truck or your car. Because if you're locked out of your car, you probably were driving it. You're either in front of your house and you're like, oh, I left my keys inside. Or you were like loading groceries at Target and the wind blew and the door's like, oh, damn it. And your, key, your keys are probably right in the car if you're stuck outside the car. A metal key like that with no chip, that'll open the door. That key does not help anyone steal your car. Even if some master thief was like under your car and was like, oh, a key, what are they going to do? They're going to open a door and then they can't start the car. If someone wants to get in your door, by the way, they're, they're not crawling under your car, right? They, if you have something on your back seat, they're just going to break the window. This key under your car doesn't really hurt you. It only helps you. So again, you, you, know, you realize, oh, shoot, my keys are missing. What am I going to do? They're in the car. I see them in the center console. Damn it. Take the metal key, open it up. There you go. Again, plan for it before you like, just came off a ski lift or something. It's negative 14 a billion, and you're, you're friggin' like trying to get the kids in the car. Oh, my God. The, I know how your winners are out here. Have that little metal key. It costs you five bucks. You never think about it for five years until the day you need it. Or, you know, be your own locksmith. I was just down in Texas, my buddy Brian, and he was like, oh, man, I love that lockpicking stuff, and now I, I keep picks on me in case I need to get in my house. I don't want to keep a key outside, but I keep picks outside. I'm like, that's pretty badass, man. You should also know a locksmith, like meet, meet some locksmith in your town, but like, do you, homie? So yeah, get the locksmith before you need the locksmith. Get the spare key before you need the spare key. All right, part four, gun. It's a touchier subject. I will try to be dispassionate. I will probably fail. 
Um, humans are bad at risk assessment in general. The concept of like need a gun is wildly off base with reality for most people. Uh, most of the people who feel the most threatened in this world are some of the safest in our society. We saw this during the pandemic. Everyone is just staying at home. You're not going out in the world meeting people, but you got to have that gun in your home, I guess. All the gun purchases skyrocketed. Uh, how many people saw that, you know, there was a, a bunch of, you know, young kids, teenagers, walking down the street to the mayor's house for a protest, and the McCloskeys came storming out of their house with their guns because, oh, there were some black teenagers on their street. I remain to this day amazed at the restraint showed by that crowd of kids. Uh, <laughs> not a single person drilled this dong wagon in with, a, with a round, with a gun pointed right at That is unbelievable poise. And you can guarantee if it was a bunch of white people walking down this street, the McCloskeys would have taken the room temperature challenge that day. Then again, they wouldn't because if it was a bunch of white people walking down the street, they wouldn't have come out of their house waving guns. Um, there are real, we're not going to get super into this. There are real risks out there in the world. Violent crime is going down, but there are pockets of, of real bad folk. I and others in my friend group have been directly targeted by fash. Like, not just with shitty tweets. Like, I've had people who've had fascists driving up and down their streets, knocking on their doors at night, screaming at them in parking lots, saying, come out here, we got to talk to you, right? My wife and I have gotten phone calls from the police, from the FBI. We've gotten like, hey, we're investigating a death threat. I'm like, oh, again? Okay. And what do you think we told them when, when they called up? Told them exactly, exactly, exactly. I said, I, you know, I'm not, leave, you know, they say, going to leave the area? I said, I'm not discussing my day. I am represented by counsel. You can refer to counsel. Remember, they are not here to help you. Law enforcement does not exist to make you safe. Law enforcement exists to prosecute and gather evidence. If you are part of the investigation, you do not have anything to say. Your lawyer has something to say. Have a lawyer. Refer to lawyer. And my wife and I didn't really feel at risk. No, we did not leave the area. We're pretty well provisioned. Uh, I'm fundamentally a very peaceful person. I abhor violence, quite frankly. I don't really even like violent movies anymore. That doesn't mean I don't own guns. Um, we're very happy about the fact that our home is properly provisioned. We're happy that friends of ours are properly provisioned and that the fash know this, and they generally leave most of my friends alone for that reason. Speaking of, though, this is a sneaky trick I hadn't seen before. A friend of mine named Chad, activist, well-known online, he got targeted by a bunch of right-wingers, and they did the following. They engage in kind of like that Scientology thing where you stand right in front of someone and make them bump into you, and then they claimed assault because he was on a sidewalk, like, marching with a sign. They filed a restraining order against it. They filed a complaint, right? They had a criminal matter opened up. So then, that means a few things. One, it means that he had to surrender all of his firearms because he had an open legal matter. He had a potential restraining order. It also involved the process server, who was the friend and also one of the right-wingers, went to his house and recorded while she was serving him, serving him papers. So trying to, because they wanted to post that on their blog or something to, like, make him look bad. Now, in the process, she recorded his home inside and out because his door was open, which is a super no-no. Uh, but what, is, what does Chad have in addition to gun? He has lawyers. His lawyer is actually a man named Ken White. Do you know who Ken White is? He's Popat online. So if you know who Popat is, you can guess how well this went for the people that made a false complaint against, against Chad. So he's fine. He got his guns back. Again, I don't want to make you think that the world is horrible. Like, violent crime is decreasing in this country. Uh, there are pockets of very violent are increasing, and they are out there, and they are targeting very, very specific groups of people. And this part doesn't always address everyone in this room. There are very, very dear to me people in my life who are very specifically targeted. Anyone in the LGBTQ community, anyone in the, who's underrepresented minorities, like, they are the ones who are getting targeted. And I love that, like, the world's awful, but it's made for some great memes. My friends and I, who's, who's got a love language of your friends just sending batshit memes to each other and laughing all the time? Like, that is kind of how we all communicate. But in addition to that, my friends who have felt, you know, targeted by bad groups, like, I have taken loads of people to the gun range. It is, it is my pleasure to take a lot of queer and trans people to get their first time behind a trigger and get them interested. And they say, you know what, this is all right. I'm, I'm going to be interested in this now. But I don't even need to be the one doing that, Right. Underrepresented groups, minority groups, are more than capable of organizing on their own, of finding their own circles, of making their own spaces. It's really just a battle of finding good information. Uh, the challenge of like getting good information in the gun world, not from a crappy person, my heart breaks for all of you, all of my friends who are like queer and trans. Like one of the most popular gun tubers literally starts every one of his videos with a with a, like a shitty slur. 
Just, just, just kind of minor gay bashing, you know, just, just throw that in there. Um, some of you know, know who this is. I'm not going to mention their full name. They're a super popular channel. There are good allies out there. My friend, I always mention my friend Carl, my friend Ian from InRange, right? Like the Gun Penguin, also pretty well known. Uh, but in the underrepresented minority world, in the queer world, in the trans world, like you have people like my friend Tactical Girlfriend. Amazing, amazing creator. There are people like her out there bringing this knowledge from literally like a queer trans immigrant woman's perspective. You have, like, if you don't like the idea of giving money to the NRA, my friend started Armed Equality. They're doing great work. Yellow Peril, they have their podcast. Clara's doing training. There's so many people out there. You can pause the slides, check the slides, the links later. I'm not going to rattle off everyone's name. But just a mix of amazing, diverse voices. You don't have to get your gun information from people that make you feel like less of a human. Uh, my friend Penelope started the Tenacious Unicorn Ranch, if you're not familiar with them. They are an inspiration and a haven, and they have a lot of wide open space. If you want to go somewhere and train on firearms and not be around people that make you feel unsafe, follow them online. Learn more about what they are doing. And before you go out and purchase a gun, again, we're not going to make this the, the gun talk. I know I'm like the gun guy, right? Um, people say, oh, well, getting a gun is so easy in America. I mean, do you really know? Have you actually done it? Have you not? There's a lot of forms you might not be expecting. I know that cannabis has become decriminalized in a lot of areas, but you know, right, if you're filling out that form 4473, no, you've never had cannabis. You don't know what it is. You've never seen it. You never smelled it. You heard about it once in a D.A.R.E. program when you were 12. You've forgotten about it since then. <laughs> different state laws, like Washington has initiative 1639. It's just different paperwork. Do you have all your documents in order? The documents I told you to start getting in order before? Think about that. You want to be purchasing something when you're not already under stress. If you are dealing like with a violent ex and you're getting stalker phone calls, that's not the time to try to go out and be sensible and buy something. That's not the time to go out and try something at the range. Go when you're not under stress. Go when times are relatively okay. Go with your friends. I have taken loads of people. I love trying their guns. They love trying mine. That is when you get yourself into the water and get your foot in the water if you've never done any firearm things. But in general, like if I'm saying a week or two, and you'll get that gun. You'll, you'll deal with it. Is it really like, why am I bringing a gun section into this? There's a few other matters to talk about. Specifically, getting a gun isn't the only thing that you're thinking about in gun, this section. A gun is not a magic talisman that just makes everything fine. All the gun people in this room know it means you have to be proficient with it. You have to be safe with it. You have to actually go out and train. A lot of my friends, again, these are all people in the, the queer space, in the trans space. These are people who don't just go out and buy a gun and throw it in a drawer. Like Artemis, Mia, like they are going to do dynamic drills, movement drills, shooting drills. If you've never gone to do any practical shooting, it's fun. Like this is an absolute hoot. I didn't think I would ever be good at this kind of thing, but learning how to do it, going out to a match, finding out how well you can run your firearm is absolutely something to try. We had some sound, but I guess uh, we're not going to do tons of gun, blah, 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 blah. Don't worry about that. Seriously, how many, how many people are gun owners in this room? I'm just curious. How, have you ever gone out to a match and shot it on the clock, actually done groups and splits? Consider it. Consider it. The clock doesn't lie. I could say, like, the movie Castaway was, was cute and he survived, but, like, even if a perfect fishing pole showed up on the beach and he was, like, starving. When you're starving on a desert island, that's not the best time to try to learn how to fish. When you're under stress and like you're targeted by some stalker or something, that's not the best time to try to learn how to like use a gun. <laughs> like, please. And also far, far, far more useful than guns are patching holes. Anybody who talks to you about gun stuff and doesn't talk to you about first aid and care is not doing you justice. So learn about I again, again, my friend, tactical girlfriend. Most of her videos are not all gun. There's all about wound care, there's about lead exposure, just being safe and being prepared to treat people. Because again, if you haven't learned how these, use, how these are used, like, <laughs> talk about tourniquets. Who has ever applied a tourniquet to someone? Not a lot of hands. Who's ever had a tourniquet applied to themselves? Almost no hands. Hopefully it was during a training class. Like, this is my leg getting a tourniquet. I'm not dealing with a horrible wound. I'm learning about it. I'm, I'm in a deployed medicine class. And you can see, that's, this guy, he's got a knee jammed right in my groin. It's not because he's a jerk. He doesn't like me. When you are applying a tourniquet to stop the bleed, you are staunch down on that femoral artery. It will cause pain. The few people who tried tourniquets in the past, 
How do they feel when they're on? They're horrible. Horrible. You are, uh, the first time I did this, I was like, you are doing this wrong. What is happening? I learned so much in these classes. If I were to ever literally try to be saving someone with a severe hemorrhage, I would be telling them verbally, assuring them, I'm going to cause you more pain than you are in right now. Trust me, this is keeping you alive. You have to take it. Until you've had a tourniquet on, you cannot fathom the excruciating pain in that limb. I would have probably tried to rip it off if I was even in a critical situation. Like, no, this can't be right. Until I experienced it. Try it. Take an actual emergency medicine class. Learn this. Go to trainings. Get your medical training. So then you can be that person at Thanksgiving dinner, like who's like, oh, you should have a fire extinguisher in your house. That person, you can be that person with like, you know, traumatic wound care. Like, do you have a good tourniquet? Is it truly a cat tourniquet? Did you pay for a fake one? Like, totally. Learn how this works. How, but quick question for the audience. How long can a tourniquet stay on without causing harm to a limb? I'm hearing something. I heard an hour. I heard two. Any other guesses? 45 minutes. The answer is two hours. Two hours. We have tons of data at this point. Now that everybody we deploy downrange in the uniform, they all have a TQ on them. We have tons of military data at this point. There is not a single occurrence from any soldier, sailor, airman, or marine who's had a TQ applied for under two hours and the limb wasn't saved. The body is fine with being cut off from like normal, op like you sever a finger and all that shop class, oh, you put it on ice and get to the hospital. They reattach it. Like we know the body can do this, but you get this really bad, who's ever heard that Boy Scout crap? Like every 15 minutes, you got to ease it off and then put it on and then you fiddle with it and you spin around. That's all nonsense. Two hours. You can go up to six hours technically, at which point you, somebody else is opening your pickle jars. But yeah, like two hours, you're fine. Put it on, leave it on, get to a higher standard of care. But training with real world tools and methods Training with your firearms, training with your aid kit. This is something that I encourage people to do. Not because you want to be violent. Again, I'm a fundamentally really peaceful person, but I have firearms. That's not a disconnect. There's a really old adage, and I know some of you have heard this. If you do not have the means of violence, you aren't peaceful. You're harmless. There's a difference. Now, getting back into use of force, we're going to segue to the last story I got for you, and it's a doozy, and at any point in this story, go ahead and walk out. I will not be upset at you. Um, this is a story that has to do with the penal system. It has to do with gender-based violence. It has to do with what is done in our name with our tax dollars and the steps you may have to take one day to move heaven and earth to save a loved one. So this is one of my loved ones. This is Carol. Uh, Kara is a hacker, a security professional, community volunteer. She's an amazingly important person in my group of friends. Uh, she's one of us. She's a geek. She's a cosplayer. She's literally won awards for like incredible cosplay that she's done over the years. Uh, back when she was in boy mode, she's trans. Back when she was in boy mode, she was a Navy corpsman, right? So she spent her time saving lives, putting people back together. And then she got herself taken apart pretty badly. Uh, she got blasted up pretty good by an IED. And ever since she's rotated back to the world, she spent most of her civilian life in hospitals. Um, she's had traumatic brain injury, multiple spinal surgeries. Uh, she can't walk unassisted. There's, there's a lot wrong with her. But it's hard to keep a good woman down, right? She serves her community every day. And we all love her very much, and we miss her because my friend Kara was arrested. My friend Kara was arrested about a month ago, a little over a month ago now, and it's been a hell of a month. Um, she was arrested by federal authorities under her legal name, she was taken to the courthouse. Uh, she was arraigned under her legal name. And you keep asking, why does Dee keep saying under her legal name? Some of you know where this is going. Uh, she was then taken to the detention center, where she was booked under her dead name and thrown in the mail unit. And I'm not going to subject you to specifics of that. But we're all just going to sit with that for a minute. Because this happens all the time. She's not even my first friend that's had this happen. I had a friend back in my home city who was swept up in an arrest. Minor ticky-tack shit, some, some domestic, you were in a fight with that person, no, that person said something, so who knows what. Thrown in handcuffs in the middle of the night, thrown in jail, thrown in the mail pop. Spent the entire evening literally hiding under a blanket, just with other prisoners, like, I'm coming for you, baby, I'm banging on the cells, the worst experience you could ever imagine. Wondering what's gonna happen when those cell doors open in the morning. And what happened is that in the AM, somebody came over and said, yeah, you're being released, get out. No explanation. 
Again, I told you, the system is cruel. The system is indifferent and callous. So they dumped her on a city street, just some random block in Seattle, no shoes, pajamas. Why no shoes? Well, because they take your shoelaces away. Shoelaces are a weapon, but it takes time to unlace them. So they'll just take your shoes. F you, what are you going to do about it? They had never turned her phone off. Her phone had like 1% battery. So she was able to call one person. Remember, you might get one phone call. Maybe that's it. And she had the wherewithal to say, this is where I am. Please come get me. But that was a one-night stay. No, Kara was in for a week in the male gen pop. And it was hell. She's getting phone privileges, right? What are you going to do? You're going to try to call somebody. She calls her ex-wife, still very good friends with her ex-wife, who panics. Ex-wife calls me. I panic. Because again, I wasn't as prepared as I wanted to be. This talk has been informed greatly by things I have learned. The first thing I did, I just called the best lawyer I knew. Like, Marsha, I'm freaking out. Who do we know in New York? And Marsha's like, well, Brian Klein is actually licensed to practice in New York. He's there all the time. You should try to call. I was like, bye, call him Brian. He's like, damn, I wish I had gotten word from you. I'm literally on a plane. I just left New York. But I got a colleague. Hang on, let me connect you with so-and-so. And we got somebody. We actually literally got a person on the ground in short order. And that's a miracle in and of itself. Now, it turns out this person is amazingly competent at many types of law. This person is a guy, that's not his picture, but he, he looks like this guy. He's, he is not set up to deal with literally a disabled Navy veteran trans person being held in the wrong gen pop. Like, he, he, he was not suited to that. This was not the right path. So we gotta figure something else out. She's still, again, in the wrong unit, being subject to abuses every day. I'm like, all right, gotta call, like, call Chelsea. I'm like, Chelsea, what the frick am I doing here? I need somebody in New York who knows these issues. Chelsea's like, oh, call Moira, amazing human, already dealing with the Bureau of Prisons and lawsuits. I'm like, thank God. So now I got someone on the phone who's a civil rights lawyer, who knows exactly who to call, who knows what motions to file. We get an actual other main lead counsel involved, and we put together a team, right? This was the most stressful, horrible time. But once you get the right people in place, people we could have had in place before if we had just kind of over dinner and drinks ever thought about this sort of thing. You never want to think about this. It helps if you think in advance, because then you get the right people who start, again, they start filing emergency petitions, saying this has to be fixed, getting judges' orders. I learned a lot real fast about how my relationship to my devices changed. You ever get off an airplane, put your phone back to regular mode, you get some missed calls, you get missed calls like this, and your stomach just drops? Yeah, didn't realize that I could get phone calls, didn't realize how the system works. Asynchronous does Communication does not work well when you have a loved one in a cage. Show of hands, who uses any kind of like call filtering? You get that like spam detected, you know, pot don't answer, unknown number on your phone. Yeah, not anymore you don't. Not with a loved one in custody. No, you pick up every damn time. You don't know who it is. Could be a lawyer's office, could be someone else. Who uses spam filtering on their email? We all use spam filtering, right? Or suspicious link detection. Not anymore you don't. Not with a loved one on the inside. Core links is the only thing you got, and it's routinely detected as suspicious because it's all a bunch of emails from prison. So maintaining communication has been incredibly hard. Trying to figure out how to get someone commissary, how to get someone money and funds using Western Union. Their name is spelled wrong and stuff. Their dead name is in the system. Eventually, we had to start figuring out, oh, we need medical paperwork. We need to prove her ID. Well, her ID is in her purse, and her purse is in an evidence locker. Having these paperwork already in advance would have made wonders. Instead, we've got our ex-wife running around the city, trying to go to her apartment. She's got a key to her apartment. Go to the apartment, and it looks trashed. Look through the window, and everything's destroyed. She's like, what the hell is this? And there's a master lock on the door. So now you're thinking locksmith. But no, you're thinking lawyer. First, I said, if I was there, I probably would have just opened this damn door. I'm glad I wasn't there, because we called the lawyers, and they said, oh, no, 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 no. That actually might be an evidence seal. That might have been the feds doing that. I'm like, isn't it supposed to be like yellow tape? She's like, no, 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 get your brain out of TV. Sometimes it's just this nonsense. Don't go in there. Let me file more paperwork. And eventually, we finally got a judge's order to say, yes, okay, no, here's a copy of the past with this person. Put them in the woman's prison, please. And Kara was finally moved. That was a miracle that took a week and a half of stress and abuse the likes I don't want to think about. But we protected her from other inmate violence. We couldn't protect her from staff violence, though. And mistreatment by the staff is why she's been moved again to a hospital. Not the prison infirmary. No, a civilian hospital. 
Do you know what it takes to be in a civilian hospital if you're a prisoner? You're near death. And that's where she's been, where she has no phone privileges. We have no idea what's happening. We don't have her ex, or if her wife was still her wife, she could talk to the doctors. But if someone's your ex-wife, you need a medical power of attorney. Things that would take no time to have set up before your life goes crazy. Do you have loved ones who are closer than a spouse or a brother or sister to you? The person they would want you to be the one in the room talking to the doctors? If you haven't done a medical power of attorney, you will be shut out. You will not be in that conversation. This takes five minutes and maybe 25 bucks to do it before it's a disaster. Our marvelous Kara, I'm not going to show you what they've done to her, but this is where things have been for weeks now. And we've just tried to console ourselves with gradual updates that trickle out through her lawyers. But again, we're like, well, we just can't talk to her. There's no, there's no phones. There's no phone on the wall. And then one day I woke up in the morning and I had voicemails. I said, what the hell? Oh, it turns out, no, like a duty officer came by with a phone, but it's an unknown number, so my phone didn't ring. I had no idea. It was Saturday morning. Most of her friends are Jewish, so they were not near their phones. So we all missed the chance to talk to her and find out an update. So next weekend comes around. It's like that movie, Catch Me If You Can. Everyone's like right by the phone. Like, they're going to call this time, right? Got up early. No calls. I went to a gun match. I was like handing my phone on shooting stages, like... Anybody who calls, just answer this phone. I've never given my phone to another human in years, let alone told them to answer it. But again, you get that one shot. You want to get that call. No calls. Then Sunday morning, we're all talking to each other in signal. Has anyone heard anything? Nobody's heard anything. No calls. No, we just didn't get a call that week. Why? F you. It's the system. The system is callous and indifferent. The next week, we cross our fingers. We hope. We pray. Saturday, no calls. Sunday, I was working at my desk And I just happened to have my my Google Voice tab open because I was like getting an MFA code or something which you shouldn't get through text, but sorry, my bank is old. And I looked and I'm like, that's weird. My phone's sitting right here. It's unknown. Why is there an unknown number calling me? And I get a voicemail. And my phone never rang. I'm like, what the hell? And I check my phone. I check the ringer. I'm messaging people. And as I'm messaging people, I get another call. And I get another transcript. And I am literally in tears at this point, not knowing what is wrong. And I'm panicking. I'm telling, is anyone going to answer? Tell someone else. She's going to call you next. I know. And I get another voicemail. You don't know what this feels like until you've been through it. I literally re-recorded my voicemail greeting to a diff. I was like, I have a different direct in dial number that I don't use. And I was like, Kara, call this number. And I told her ex-wife, call this number. Eventually, she did. She, she got the number. She called. So we got to talk briefly that day. And talking is important. Communication is so important. If you ever have a loved one who is jammed up, Communication is what keeps them alive. And the system is not set up for that. Uh, I eventually learned, tip to you, because it's a prison call, it shows up as potentially spam or something. So like Google Voice does not give you granular help here. I just have to turn this off. And now my phone is a sewer of nonsense. (laughs) All of our phones are. And that's what you go through. That's what you on the outside go. And it's worth it. Kara is worth it to all of us on the outside who are pulling for her. She gave far more than this in the service for her country, and we're going to be here for her. If you want to know more about this, if you want to support Kara or talk to me more about it, I'm not up here starting to go fund me. Just stay in touch. You can find me online. Um, her story will be out there. There's one move I'll give you, though, if you want to, if you want to and I know we're a little long, but I'm gonna, we're going to wrap it up in a few minutes here. Uh, one is a really special move, right? The idea of if someone you know is jammed up, and you've got a bunch of people, what they're going to try to do is like they get their call, right? So they try this person, oh, that person, they couldn't reach them. They try this person, oh, that person didn't pick up or was busy or they unknown number, didn't go through. They might try to get, maybe they reach person C for like a little bit. Oh, here's what happened. I'm here. I miss you. Hey, tell, tell mom this. And they only have a few minutes. And the officer's like, hey, you've got to wrap this up. You're going you're gonna to make any more calls or not? Well, I've got to go, but I'm going to talk to someone. All right, bang. You try someone else. Oh, you couldn't reach them. You're playing this freaking game, right? Then you're out of time. You could consider, among your trusted circle of friends, setting up talk route or ring central or somebody does a dab hand at asterisk. You get one canonical like emergency number. Call that number and it rings everyone's phone. Whoever picks, my company does this for our inbound phone calls, for our support line. And who, whichever one of the partners picks up, we're the one on that call. And we even set it so it shows up as that number. So we save that number in our phones as like, you know, company call. You could do that. You could save that number in all your phones and be like, holy crap, pick up now. 
So it rings everyone's phone, somebody gets it, and then you're all in signal like, hey, who called the emergency number? What's going on? And then everyone spun up and talking. And you got a human. You got a human to human immediate connection. Or you conference other people in. Super, super critical. Talk to your lawyers. If someone is in custody just because they got arrested, maybe you can have a conference call. If someone is in prison, you cannot have three-way conference calls of any kind. They will lose their phone privileges. They'll be sent to the shoe. You will not talk to them again. Talk to your lawyers. But having that one phone number to ring all your friends and emerge, it doesn't have to be a prison situation. It could literally be, I'm on the side of the road, my car's dead, my battery's almost dead, and you don't have time to screw around figuring out who's awake. You call the emergency number, and because you set it up as VoIP, you can make it memorable. Like, this is the one number you remember. And like, everyone just, that's the one I'm going to call in case anything happens. <laughs> I got another tip. And you're being, I'm so, so kind, you're being very respectful. We've gone a little over the hour. But these last couple ones, I'm really going to, this one might, might be good for you. So let's say you have someone in your life, and this person is missing. We'll call them Missing Manny up at the top there. If Manny goes missing, their friends are all worried about him, right? Friends are worried about Manny. What, what happened to them? Do we know where they are? They should have been on that plane by now. Everyone's messaging. They're all on their phones. Manny may not have a phone, right? It may be dead. It might be taken away from them. Whatever their circumstances are, it could be lost. This is where the special lawyer comes into play. My wife and I and a few of our very critical close circle of friends have a special lawyer. They have one job. She lives overseas. She has special practice. We only talk to her for this one thing. The special lawyer has the master passwords to all of our critical friends' vaults, in their vault. In this sense, this is not for your whole group of friends. This is for your critical, trusted circle. You get established as a trusted circle. You talk to the lawyer. And what happens is, like, Samantha's spouse calls the lawyer and says, hey, there's been an emergency. Manny is missing. They're inexplicably absent, detained. Maybe they're in a coma. You don't know. But like, we need to get into their password vault. We need to get into their critical documents. We need something from them. The lawyer says, OK. Immediately sends a message out to the rest of the circle and says, the emergency protocol is being invoked. Samantha Spouse has asked me for Manny's password. There's a 72-hour pause while everyone can think about this. Chances are the rest of the circle already knows what's up. But maybe Samantha's lying. Maybe there's a, like a divorce going on. Any one of those friends can say to the lawyer, uh, wait one. Let's figure out that something's fishy. Because it immediately the cat's out of the bag the moment that Samantha makes the request. Maybe Manny's not missing. Maybe Manny's like on a beach and is like, what the hell is this bullshit? Like, you, you have that. But if nothing happens, if nobody objects, the lawyer releases the top master password. And you can get into the records and the critical things and all that you need. That can be a huge difference in those critical hours of dealing with the State Department or dealing with a lawyer or who knows what. This protocol applies perfectly well even if a spouse dies or both spouses die. Tara and I are almost always together. A lot of the time, I'm in the right seat of a plane that she is flying. So like, maybe we go down together. Who knows? That's, that's a cool way to go out, in my opinion. But people still need to you know, set our affairs in order. Our friends in our trusted circle can still work with the lawyer. They can make changes to social media. They can say, hey, maybe don't tweet at this guy. He did. You know, whatever you got to do. But there's, there's, in this instance, we have a backup. Now, you don't have to do this with a lawyer. If you're familiar with Shamir's shared secrets, you can do, it's a lot more technical lift, right? But you can have a, a locked archive and multiple people with distributed keys. And you can set it so that like three out of five or six out of 10 or whatever, pre, whatever number of keys you need can be brought together to deconstruct that top master key and open the archive. This is something that we need to talk about. This is some, we, we used to like not talk about death and dying, like getting, go, go get yourself a will. Or when it became really good at keeping people alive, but like not alive, like on ventilators, we had to start talking about do not resuscitate orders, right? Advanced medical directives. That was a weird thing to talk about for years. But people, oh, don't talk about that. Oh, Maron, give yourself the maloik. I'm going to tempt the fate. We got over that as a society. We talk about that now. We need to start having this equivalent of a discussion for our digital lives. And we don't yet. We need to start talking about how painful it is to a lot of friends to still see that old Facebook page from your dead friend from three years ago with that last update that's still there. And like, yeah, technically social media companies have ways to do that, but it's clunky. Consider these other means. Consider some of these plans and come up with a plan for these emergencies. 
Uh, my conclusion is, is very brief. Um, I have been involved in a lot of different projects in my life. Uh, one of the most important things that I've ever gotten to be a part of was being embroiled in a prosecutorial matter at the federal level. Um, we all learned really fast. No one knew what we were doing, but the community came together, we put the right pieces in place, and a young man's life was saved, and he's free, and he's part of our world now. Uh, this was a good result. Make no mistake, sorry to my State Department friends, like getting to just gouge a thumb right in the eye of a federal prosecution was one of the most proud moments of my life. And if all of you take this kind of knowledge, and I'll give you a little checklist. If you work down this checklist, you can be the thorn in the side of an attacker, of a, of a threat. That could be a civilian threat, a government threat. It could be any intangible thing. Horrible things can happen. But, you know, SANS is, like, known for their top 20 and the NIST cyber controls top 20. I'm going to give you a top 20. We're going to bash down it real quick. Think about all of these in the context of some of the scenarios I've discussed. This is a long list, but you can take bites of it over time. Starting with something you probably aren't. I'll give you a freebie. Who here uses a password manager? Great. Those of you who aren't using it, start using one. And don't just put passwords in it. Put everything in it. Put your copies of your birth certificate, your driver's license, your will. Just shove it in there. There's notes fields. Like, get critical stuff in there so it's in one place, getting backed up to the cloud if you're using 1Password. One 1Password one is one of my favorite ones, right? It syncs across all your devices. Get your closest friend's contact info. I don't just mean, like, know how to tweet at them. How many people have, a, like, some really good friends that you're only on, like, social media with them? And sometimes they like put their account on lock or they get banned or they go dark or something. You're like, oh shit, I don't actually know how to reach that person. Get your closest friend's contact info. Get their most unchanging email address, not their work address where they're going to get a new job. Put that in your contacts, right? Get their full birth date if they're really close to you. Getting things like medical records, dealing with hospitals, full birth dates matter. Make that wallet card that phone case card, those critical numbers, put it in your phone case. Once you've established your trusted circle, you're going to have that conversation. You're going to have that conversation about MFA backup codes. Remember when you get your MFA, like you set up your device and Google Authenticator, and you get those backup codes, right? What do, what do you do with those? You just shove them in your password manager, which lives on your phone, which then goes in a sewer. No, take some of those backup codes and give them to your other friends over Signal and say, keep these in your password manager. I will probably never need these one day, but just in case, they've got them. Agree to have a check-in every so often, right? It's, it's almost kind of like NATO. Like, just establish, we are the trusted circle. I could leave my house at the drop of a hat if I'm under threat. Can I stay in your bedroom? You can stay in mine. I will put up bail for you. You'll put up bail for me, right? Get a lawyer. Obtain legal representation. Talk to your friends who have lawyers. Start with anyone in your hometown who does any kind of criminal defense. If you literally know no one and you're in a small town, sit in court. You will see the same lawyer showing up for multiple cases. Watch how well they do. Are they getting people off? Ask for a card. Pay for one call or one appointment, right? Come at it the other direction, though. Come at it with business and estate law, right? Get those, get those documents in order. Get those documents in order, like family planning documents, estate planning, and then say, hey, do you have a trusted colleague who does criminal defense? Could I meet them? Save that number in your phone. At that point, you are not lying if you tell an authority figure, I choose to remain silent. I am represented by counsel. Those key life documents that I keep hammering on, your will, your personal property memoranda, your advanced directives, there's a difference between a power of attorney for legal matters and a medical power of attorney. You don't have to give someone legal authority over your life to make sure they're in the room talking to a surgeon. Medical authority letters are separate. You can do that. You can have non-spouses making medical decisions. Maybe your parents would not honor your wishes. You don't want it to be your parents or somebody. Talk to your lawyer. You pay to generate the documents. You notarize them. You keep them in a drawer. Not just your drawer. You make copies. You give them to all your trusted circle. Birth certificate. Even if you hate your dead name, get three or four. Then you work on changing it, right? Obtain your hard copies. If you are thinking of changing your birth certificate, if you are thinking of changing your gender marker, do not wait. Do it now. The writing is on the wall in a lot of states. Then you get yourself a passport because you got your documents in order, right? If you're a procrastinator, I said, just download the DS-11. Fill it out. Go to the drugstore and get the photos. And they're just going to be sitting on your desk looking at you. And then you're like, all right, all right, I'm going to mail this thing off. Figure out how to make a money order at the post office. 
Get a passport. I will tell you right now, if anyone ever comes up to me in the future, from now till eternity, and you show me a U.S. passport, any passport, frankly, with a validity start date of November or December of 2022, meaning you didn't have it, and you got it before the end of the year, I will buy your drinks. This is an open friggin' offer. I will buy your first few drinks. <laughs> and you can keep hitting me up. Come at me anytime you see me in public in a conference in an airport. Show me a November or December 2022 passport, and I will hug you and buy you a drink. Back up your data. If your house blows up, is it all just in a drawer, right? This could be something super simple like G Drive with scripts. You could use Carbonite, Crash Plan, Tresserit, whatever my friend Snubs recommends, just do that. If your really boss move is like your trusted circle, y'all have Synology, NASes, do that remote sync, right? Maybe not on your entire media collection, just have that one critical folder that's like super important shit and like synchronize your birth certificate and all that stuff. Life insurance, valuable personal property insurance, right? If you are old enough and you have real assets, put these policies in place. Understand who gets your stuff when you die. Make sure your trusted circle knows who gets your stuff. Again, it's not easy for some people to talk about. Do you know what happens to unclaimed or lost money in bank accounts? If it just can't, we can't figure out this person had no kids, what happens to it? Do you know? Government takes it. We've seen what they do with your money. Start that shared vault framework, either through Shamir's secret sharing or maybe through that special lawyer. Your top, top, top password does not die with you. It has to live on with your trusted circle so that they can live on and do what has to be done if you are gone. The whole first half of this list, you don't even have to leave your house. You can do every one of these first 10 things without putting on pants. <laughs> now let's step outside. You're going to take a Stop the Bleed class. You are going to take a Traumatic Wound Care Stop the Bleed class. You're going to learn amazing things. You're going to meet amazing people. This will be your toe in the water to other trainings that I know a lot of you are going to want to take. You're going to want to keep learning this, and you're going to be a better citizen for your community members. If you don't know how to shoot, Go with a friend who can take you shooting. If you know how to shoot, go out there and shoot on the clock. Try competing. I'm not out here telling you to you know, buy any gear. You're all you know, gadget hags. We're all hackers, right? You're going to get all tricked out with your gear or not. But go out and push yourself on the clock. Just post those groups and splits, right? Do it. Find a locksmith during the day, right? Have that conversation. Remember, findalocksmith.com if you want to make sure they're not a scam artist. Literally try calling the lockout service at night. Call them up. See if someone answers. See if no one answers. Say, yeah, I'm here at this address. Oh, my, my thing. And see if they're going to, how long do they say they're going to come out? Will they give you, will you say, now you'll provide a written estimate, right? Are they pulling your leg? You can get off the call anytime. Say, oh, thank God, no, my friend is coming. I sent her a text. I didn't know she, yeah, she's got my spare key, but thanks so much. Bye. You're not obligated to anything. You just verified, you tested your backup before you needed it, right? Set a calendar reminder for a couple years in the future to see if they're still in business. Maybe meet your neighbors. Maybe actually get to trust them one day. How many people know their freaking neighbors? I, my wife thought I was the strangest person in the world that I met my actual neighbors. And she's like, what are you doing? We don't do that out in the Pacific Northwest. But no, my neighbors have a key, right? My neighbors have a key. They actually have the code to our lockbox, which is, you know, right there. Maybe you're at the point where your neighbors have a key. And you build some... So now, we're, we're getting into some reach goals here, right? But like, I gave a whole talk about de-escalation training, soft skills... As my friend Bree likes to say, like to the, she's like, oh my God, hackers, y'all need therapy. Get your head right and be in a place where you can do some real good from the rest of the world when you're under stress. Again, real, real reach goals. You're not all going to get to the end of this list easily and anytime soon. Have a go bag. It's not the go bag that some prepper website's showing you. It's literally a bag with hard copies and a flash drive with electronic copies of all these documents. Spare medical supplies, glasses when you get a new prescription. Throw your old prescription in your go bag. If your main glasses are broken, they're going to be still at least something. If you have pets, kids, maybe throw a few diapers, some cat chow in there, right? Phone charger. Even if it's a crappy phone charger or a power bank, throw it in there. Maybe even run drills. My wife and I run a drill where we evac the house as if we had to leave, maybe not coming back. Pack the cats, pack the bags, pack the rifle, get in the car. That second passport, that's going to be a real reach. You do that, you're, you're getting really into those long-term robust goals of like real surety, real deep, deep, deep protections, defense in depth. And at the end of that, I mean, it just gets easy, right? You know, you divest your local police department, you abolish prisons, like, you know, the simple stuff that we should get to one of these days. And the last one I'll tell you is never miss the opportunity 
to tell everybody in your life how much you love them and miss them and how much they matter to you and how much you will be there for them and you appreciate them because you will probably lose the opportunity when the worst thing happens. And I encourage you to be prepared. If you start small, you start local, you start with your trusted circle, you will be astounded at what you can accomplish. If enough of us make our way through a list like this, that is what changes the world. That is what changes lives. We've heard so many times from the hacker world, right? The cavalry's not coming. It's just us. It's just us. They don't keep us safe. We keep ourselves safe. We protect us. Thank you for listening. Honduras. I'm a desperate man. Send lawyers, guns, and money. The shit has hit the fan. Guns and money Send lawyers, guns and money